And so I light this candle for the spirit of truth, which we will see was what the Fillmores dedicated themselves, their lives, all they had and all they ever hoped to have to the spirit of truth. So today's message is the first installment of the Unity Saga. How did we get this far is the topic. So we need to get out our archaeologists, archaeologists hats and our sociologists hats because the evolution of the Unity Movement reflects the society in which it occurred. And one of these days I have to get back my book from Joni I loaned her on Charles Fillmore, just a book about the biography of Charles Fillmore by Hugh D'Andrade. And I was learning more about Charles than I ever knew before. And here's the thing. You all know he was born on an Indian reservation in Minnesota. No? Yeah. He was born, his father was an Indian agent. And the thing is, okay, so he was kidnapped by the Indians of the tribe there and kept in their camp when he was about eight years old for nobody knows how long, maybe days, maybe weeks, we don't know. But he came back from that, changed. <laughs> and uh, his, meanwhile, his father had gone to live alone. He, he, um, he actually abandoned the family. And Charles supported himself and his mother his whole life. And you're going to see pictures of that in a minute. But the point I want to make is that uh, Charles was a very quick and able learner. He learned how to assay minerals. He went, he went to all the mining camps and made a living assaying the uh, the claims and the and the deposits that were brought to val to you know evaluate, he went out to lots of different places in Colorado and California, and speculated on land, and turned over land and real estate really fast and, and made made a lot of money. So he he kept doing this. He kept going to new places, starting some new business that had never been done before, learning the ins and outs of it, being successful at it and then bombing out when it failed, when it busted, then going to a new place. So can you imagine, by the time he got to Kansas City, when he was about 40, and Kansas City was a booming real estate town then, he knew a lot about how to make a successful financial entity. And that's what he did with unity. And here's the thing. Unity is not established like a religion. It's established like a corporation. And uh, he applied what he learned to the business of creating a spiritual work. I've always thought of unity as being a throwback to the early church, to the early Jesus movement, the beginning. In those early days, everyone knew each other throughout the movement, just like in the book of Acts, all the Christians knew each other. And conferences and reunions were times of sharing and really exchanging powerful energies. And that's about the time that my mother showed up in the, in the early 30s. Was, uh, they started ordaining people right around 1929. And uh, people, they all knew each other. They had uh, a network of real communion and intimacy and love and appreciation for each other. So now, at this point, I want to give out the photo albums. So I want, I want to tell you what all these photographs show. So would you like to pass them out? And someone take some to the back, the back room. Thanks. Yeah. And let me have what I need. Well, there we go. So there's always more to say about unity lore and unity history, and I'm not trying to do an in-depth biography of, of the Fillmores yet. But what I do want to give you is kind of a feel for 
the roots and, and the firm foundation that we have as a spiritual movement. So on the cover, when you get yours, when you get on the, on the cover, you have the Fillmore family. Now, look at Charles sitting in the middle there. He looks so stern and serious. He was not like that at all. But he was called Papa Charlie. He always had a vagabond staying in his living room. And he, you, we're going to see some footage of him speaking eventually. He was, he sounded like an old farmer who just came in from the field, just talking real down to earth. He wasn't particularly charismatic or he didn't have like an outgoing personality, you know, and he wasn't selling things, but he was so skilled. He was a printer's devil, so he knew how to he knew how to set up print and print publications and all that. So now to Charles's left is Myrtle, who was completely healed of tuberculosis around the age of 40. And her sons were half grown then. But at this point in time, I don't know what year this is, but uh, those are the sons behind them that are grown men. And then on Charles's right is Mary Fillmore, Mother Mary, who was with the couple all through their travels of the Earl of the Old West. Pueblo, Colorado was one of the times they spent. California, Utah. She was there the whole time, and guess what she did? All the cooking. And Myrtle, and when they finally got to Kansas City, she opened the Unity Inn cafeteria a vegetarian cafeteria, which was the best vegetarian cafeteria in all of Kansas City. And she, um, Charles provided for her his entire life. So it was always Charles and his wife and his mother. And then the three boys. Now, the one on the left is Lowell. I knew Lowell Fillmore. He lived to be in his 90s. He was married to a wonderful woman named Alice, and he became the, um, I don't know what his title was, maybe vice president of Unity School. He managed the entire business operation of the Unity workers. And he wrote books about the Unity teaching, very positive uh, writer. He, he published the weekly Unity for years that gave a lesson for every church to study, whether they had a minister or a lesson or not, they had their weekly Unities. <laughs> They don't publish that anymore. And Lowell was so endlessly friendly with, and, and full of goodwill. So he became an administrator. And then the middle son is Rickert Fillmore. It was, he was, his name was Waldo, named after Ralph Waldo Emerson, because they were big transcendentalists, the Fillmores. That's how they met, going to a transcendentalist literary meeting. And so they named their second son, Waldo Rickert Fillmore. And he was an artist, and he became an architect. And he designed the buildings. All of the buildings on Unity Village are designed by Rickert Fillmore. He was also a painter. He has paintings. They recently did an art show of his artwork. He also designed the uh, Country Club Plaza, which is a shopping area of, U of Kansas City. And that happened when, after Unity Village was built and thriving, the city fathers of Kansas City decided they were going to have this luxurious shopping area, and they went to Rick Fillmore and said, would you design us a shopping area in that Italian Renaissance style that you have at, Unity's, at Unity Village? And he said, well, I will if you save a spot for us to have a Unity Church there. And so that was the agreement, and that's why they have that big Unity Temple on the plaza in Kansas City. And then on the right is Royal Fillmore. Uh, and he was the youngest son. You can see he, he doesn't look like his body is well balanced and he died very young. He died in his early 20s. And uh, he was the one, he was very enthusiastic about unity supporting children and attending to children's needs. And he was the one who found unity the Unity Farm as a property to buy and said they should buy it 
to be a, a summer camp for children. And that was originally the plan when they bought it. And then he uh, was married to a woman he, uh, that he loved very much, and she died in childbirth, and he died a year later. And uh, it devastated him, and that was a hard thing for Myrtle to, uh, to take. And, but she prayed through it, and uh, so, you know, he did not survive with the rest of the family many, very many, for very long. Now, if you turn the first page open, those are two pictures of Myrtle Fillmore as a young woman when Charles would have met her. And uh, she, was, she was from Page, Ohio, which was named after her family. Her maiden name was Page, Myrtle Page. And she went to Oberlin College and graduated and became a teacher. Uh, and she met Charles at a literary meeting in Texas when he happened to be down in Texas. Now, on the other page, side is pictures of Charles as a younger man and an older man. I don't, I don't, I've never seen any pictures of Charles Fillmore at, as young as we see Myrtle here. The one um, at the top with his receding hairline but still dark hair I don't think that's very flattering. He still looks like a fanatical <laughs> whatever, I don't know. But uh, he never was fanatical. He never was uh, imposing and, and uh, pressing. He was just dedicated and skilled and a very masterful uh, creator of thought. He so grasped the early teachings of the school of metaphysics. Well, I'll tell you about that later. And then so the lower picture is him with white hair. That's how people mostly remember him, with the um, kind of beatific round forehead and face and white hair, uh, and just a very poised man. He toured after Unity had grown to a certain point in the 40s. He died in 1948, and, and he, he was touring all over California in those latter years, in his 90s. Now, if you turn to the next page, the first woman you see there is Emma Curtis Hopkins, who was a, an early collaborator with Mary Baker Eddy. They split, and she, Emma Curtis Hopkins, went to Chicago and founded a school of metaphysics. Her only known book is high mysticism. And she was a teacher of, met, of, of Christian metaphysics and capturing that mystical experience and living from that. So her students in her school of metaphysics went on to establish all these movements, Christian science, not Christian science, Christian science kind of considers us an offshoot of them. And in the early days, we were very uh, adamant that we were not an offshoot of Christian science. However, we kind of are. And all of the New Thought movement is an offshoot of New... I mean, all of New Thought and Christian science is part of the same waking up that I think was actually triggered by the, fun, by the transcendentalist movement. But the transcendentalists didn't have any formal schools or structure. But these people who were inspired by those ideas then went on to expand on them. And what I'm trying to say is that like, um, there were many names, right now I don't know them all, but uh, who started their own movements, divine science, science of mind, religious science, and unity. And they were all friends in those early days, and they wrote for each other's newsletters and magazines and shared their ideas together. And one of those early metaphysicians, next to Emma Curtis Hopkins, you can write down the, that's why I didn't write them down, you can write down what they are, is Lessons in Truth by H. Emily Cady. That's Emily Cady. A younger picture of her. Her other pictures in the Lessons in Truth books are she's much older. She was a she was a homeopathic physician in New York City 
And um, she studied metaphysics, and she became good friends with the Fillmores. Now, Bob Whitlock told me that he just read in one of the editions of Lessons in Truth that Emily Cady did, never came to Unity School to teach because her, she thought that her personality was so um, overpowering that she would have um, outshone or, or kind of taken over, occluded the rest of the people there, and she didn't want that to happen, so she stayed away. Okay. And then down at the bottom, <laughs> that is the Fillmore boys when they were still young with their mother when she was still kind of young. That's, that's Myrtle, probably in her middle 40s. And the one on the left, that's Royal, he's still a boy. The one in the middle, Lowell, he's the oldest, he's probably in his teens. And you can see how serious he is and how, um, I don't know, sociable. He's, 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 he was a real social person. And then the one on the right is Rickert as a young boy, the artist, the artist. Now on the right side of the page, I have one of the pictures of, of Charles that looks more like him to me. It's more his, his expression. And that was a cover of an early edition of Talks on Truth. I couldn't find that picture without, without the Talks on Truth in it. And then a picture of Myrtle. That's the picture that's on her book called Myrtle Fillmore, Mother of Unity. And that's kind of how she was remembered, how people thought of her. Uh, that was kind of the biggest arc of her presence was looking like that. You know, very, um, I don't know, I just think she looks graceful and, and, um, and so enlightened. And then down below... I don't know who, who everybody is in this picture, but Myrtle is in the middle. Charles is up to, slightly to her right, looking serious again, you know. He was a fairly small man. And uh, uh, you can see that they're, they're both kind of small people. And then just right behind Myrtle is Lowell again. Handsome man. Now the couple's... To, to Myrtle's left with the handlebar mustache and the woman, I don't know who they are. It doesn't tell you anywhere on the internet. I could probably ask the archives library, but I've asked them enough for the time being. And then down on the right, lower right, that's Charles's mother, Mary, in her very old age. And now I'll turn the page and I'll see something. <laughs> So there's Myrtle, cover of her book, Torchbearer to Light the Way. And down below is the, book, is the building, the home, that was designed by Rick, Rickert, that, uh, for Myrtle and Charles to live in. And it's called The Arches. You can see why it has the, or those arches. And it has no kitchen was built without a kitchen because Myrtle never cooked because the mother made all the cook did all the cooking and that's how when we I, when I first heard that I was on a tour I said well that's how I know I really am a reincarnation of Myrtle because I I don't cook either I'm trying though and then on the right is Charles in his office with his secretary over 40 years she was his secretary Cora Dedrick and she married him several years after Myrtle passed away. Because by that time, Charles, this is what my mother told me, she said, well, Charles was just so frail, we wanted him to last as long as possible, and he had to be cared for up close, so she married him and took care for him, and he needed that. And then turn one more page, and you can see Charles and Myrtle in their later years. Even though Myrtle had heels on, she still was uh, shorter than Charles, and he was, as I say, not that tall. And you can see on the, the, his leg on the left side, it looks a little out of line. That was his withered leg that was shorter than the other leg because he had had tuberculosis of the hip at 12 years old and it uh, stopped one of his legs from growing. And from, from then on, he recovered from that. He almost died in that illness. 
And when he, he, he dislocated his hip in a, in a fall when he was ice skating, and it got infected. And he said he had so many different treatments. He had um, bloodletting and leeches and all kinds of things. He, and he survived the treatments. And that was what convinced him of the power of spiritual healing was when he started to pray in the silence, his legs started to grow. And by the end of his life, he didn't uh, limp anymore. But now, I included this, this picture of this dedication and covenant because that is so inspiring. That is, to me, that reveals our spiritual strength of foundation. This is not a document that was widely shared when, when it was written. It was, written it, was, it was written in 1892. Now, we count the beginning of the unity movement as 1889 with the first publication of a magazine called, that he called Modern Thought. 89. So three years later, he sat down and wrote this. I'm going to read it to you because it shows you how his turn of thought was. He was very businesslike. He was very um, clear, boundaries set. And he didn't he didn't show this to anyone except Myrtle. Myrtle signed it too. It was found after he died in 1948, tucked away in one of his books. Isn't that something? But it was, a, it was an agreement made between him and the spirit of truth. It has since been widely shared. But I just want you to be aware of the actual, the fine points, the subtleties of this. Notice the imprint, Unity Book Company at the title, with the wings, the winged globe. Metaphysical book dealers and publishers. We Wisdom School, Kansas City, Missouri. Thought, 48-page magazine, $1 per year. Unity Weekly Paper, 50 cents per year. Metaphysical series, 15 cents per copy. So you see, he, he fleshed out his vision and he put it down on paper and he shared it. He put it out there. Okay. Dedication and covenant underlined. Dedication and covenant. We, Charles Fillmore and Myrtle Fillmore, husband and wife, Hereby dedicate ourselves, our time, our money, all we have and all we expect to have to the spirit of truth and through it to the society of silent unity. It being understood and agreed that the said spirit of truth shall render unto us an equivalent for this dedication in peace of mind, health of body, wisdom, understanding, love, life, and an abundant supply of all things necessary to meet every want without our making any of these things the object of our existence. One sentence. In the presence of the conscious mind of Christ Jesus, this seventh day of December, 1892, Charles Fillmore, Myrtle Fillmore. I feel that same dedication. Do you? To me, it's not a matter of, you know, hours per week or a salary per, per, per week, per month. No, it's all I have, all I am, all I think about is moving this, moving this message of truth forward and reaching out to more people and partnering with those who wish to go on this road. Okay, now the next picture. <laughs> now just check your picture on the cover of your program folder. You see that's the Unity Tower? And this is the beginning of the construction of the Unity Tower, look at that. See those four bush things? So they had a dedication and prayer, 1929, they bought the property and the first thing they built was this water tower. Can you see it? 
that became the tower that's on the cover. Well, well, there's more pictures of that. And the building on the other side is the first building that they occupied, 917 Tracy, that housed Silent Unity, Letter Writers. It housed the subscription business and publications. And today there is, in the building next door to it, they actually use both of those buildings. There is called Unity Truth Universal. A minister went in there and refurbished the building and, and uh, has a Unity Church in there at 917 Tracy. Now I'll turn the next page. You see this other building with a slightly different tower. And that is the Unity Temple on the plaza that Rick Fillmore designed and built, and it was the flagship church. I don't have to show you, you've got one. It was the flagship church. It has four stories, a basement, a first floor, second floor, and third floor. They have all kinds of meetings and classes there. They have a lot of 12-step uh, gatherings there. There are three sanctuaries, small, medium, and large. There is a uh, Montessori school on the lower level, and there is a um, Mediterranean food restaurant on the lower level and a bookstore. No, no elevators in the building. <laughs> and uh, it's very successful. It's been led by Reverend Duke Tufty for about 30 years. And uh, he's always, he's very progressive. He's always partnering with, in fact, he started the Cornerstone Foundation speaker series and was the first person to host Deepak Chopra as a speaker and Michael Redfield who wrote The Self-Esteem Prophecy and uh, Neil Donald Walsh and Sonia Choquette, you know her, and um, Jean Houston have all spoken at Unity Temple, so cool. Now, on the next page over, you see the fountains. Those fountains had to be redesigned. They don't look like that anymore. In the early, uh, and, that, and that building is the most beautifully ornate piece of the Italian Renaissance architecture that was built. Community Village, that's the administration building. Now, the, the basement of those buildings, the, uh, the underground level, was where the printing presses were. And for decades, they printed their own, all of their own materials, the pamphlets, the books, the, the weekly subscriptions, the, you know, all the magazines. There was good business for businessmen. There was progress for teenagers. <laughs> there was uh, uh, Unity Magazine, which is the only uh, publication that still goes, is a periodical. But... The fountains were part of the air conditioning system, see. But over the years, it all had to be replaced and it couldn't be done the same way. And the pinning became computerized and was farmed out to uh, co corporate entities. So everything changed. But when this picture took place, when this picture was taken, it was still all going on. It was still all very self-sufficient. And then turn one more page, and you have... Did you know there was a labyrinth at Unity Village? And it's painted on this parking lot that they weren't using that much. And they use it for retreats. That's a YOU conference having their final goodbye in a circle around the labyrinth. And if you look in the far upper left corner, See that cute little cottage? That is just a shell. There's nothing in there but storage space for the, all the gardening equipment that they use to maintain the grounds. And then uh, to the left, you see a little curve of a, of a, of a, a white line. It's a curb uh, that goes up to the new um, conference center. Well, no, it's not a conference center. That's the hotel. It's the, um, I forget the name of it, but it's a great big auditorium that holds thousands of people. That's where they have Unity Village Chapel now and guest speakers. And then to your right, you can see the tower in all of its glory. You know, you can see it for miles around. And I can remember driving with my parents to visit Unity 
as a kid, and we'd always be looking. Oh, you're going to be able to see the tower. It'll be showing soon. And we'd be looking and looking, and then right on the horizon, we could see this little teeny tower. And it's was a, originally it was a water tower, but it's uh, no longer a water tower. It's not strong enough, I don't think. And they use the b lower level of it for um, a visitor center. And can you see that little bridge to the left in the picture? That's going over the fountains, the reflecting pool. That's all still there, but it, it, uh, it, the water is routed a little differently. But the, um, the fountain, the bridge is called the Bridge of Faith. And it's a very favorite spot for people to get married on. And it's, uh, it's just a beautiful little spot to meditate and sit and wander. If you go there. I think we should all go together to Unity Village. What do you think? Yeah? Why don't we set that as a, an intention? By when should we plan to go? Next summer? Or is that too soon? Huh? Well, do we have to go in summer? It's hot, yeah. Well, think about that. Think about that. Wouldn't it be wonderful to go together? Many churches do go as a group. Hire a bus, ride on out there, go to a, maybe a retreat. So keep your eye on the activities they have for what you'd like to do out there. Th this is my favorite place in the world. When my children grew up and I had an empty nest, what did I do? I closed up shop and I moved to Kansas City just to be around Unity work around the village, just to be part of the scene there. I didn't really have any bigger intentions than that. I just want to be there. And I ended up, after eight years, going to ministerial school. <laughs> and now, the final page. That's um, a picture of a performance at the Unity Band concert. They had an outdoor amphitheater, huge amphitheater, like five times as big as this room, with little benches. And every Sunday night, Carl Frankheiser would conduct the Unity Band, and they would have these performers. Now, do you notice there is one standout performer there, a beautiful woman, you notice her? That is Pauline Denniston. She was a, a Broadway star. She was a Broadway performer. She sang, and she was gorgeous. And she and Carl Frankheiser were close friends, let's say. And uh, <laughs> yeah, they, they were, and he, when he left, quote unquote, show business to go to Unity and work, he invited her to come also because they shared this uh, interest in spiritual things. And so she did. She left New York, left the stage came to live in Kansas City. She was the standout soloist at Unity Temple on the Plaza, drew huge crowds for them. And she was a standout performer for the band concerts on Sunday nights. Hundreds and hundreds of people used to come. I was at one of those concerts, several of them, and I remember her. She was uh, breathtakingly beautiful, if you can see in this picture. You can see, she, she was just, uh, and she sang as beautiful as anyone has, I've ever heard singing. She sang, and then they did a lot of the Broadway show tunes and attracted huge crowds. And that was one of the big things that brought Unity into the limelight at Can in Kansas City. Um, they were, <laughs> you know what finally kind of faded it out was uh, the popularity of the Ed Sullivan show. <laughs> On Sunday nights, yeah. But uh, that was quite, quite a heyday there. So I want to leave you with this thought that we see that we are poised to engage, poised to accept new ideas, poised to be inclusive and partnering with all the new waves of energies that are coming in. That's how we got this far. Thank you. 
And so now is the time when we capture the opportunity to have our very own mystical experience with the divine. For each of us has a direct connection with the mind of God. And so as we relax, become perfectly comfortable in our bodies, breathe deeply the breath of God. Become perfectly comfortable in our hearts, letting go of all resistance and all concern. Become perfectly comfortable in our minds, allowing light to fill every thought. Letting go to come into the inner closet. Where we find that joy, and that surrender. And so let us take our meditation statement together. We grow in unity and love together. We grow in unity and love. And let us hold that silently in our hearts. To know this. To know how we love the truth that makes us free. As we do indeed grow in unity and love. As we feel this deeply now in the silence. in the beauty and stillness of God's love. In that life divine where we dance freely, creatively, joyously. A new dance. Creating new life, new peace, new love, transformed by the power of God. And so it is. Amen.
Thank you.